I would, as we begin the event, I would like to ask Anne Gerson, our bilingual senior specialist from the marketing and communications team to share the land acknowledgement for us in English and French. Anne will also provide active offer in French during the Q&A portion of the event. Anne? Sorry. Thank you, Rich. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, Shoni, and the Wendat peoples, which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We acknowledge, recognize, and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work and the contributions of all indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. Je m'adresse à vous aujourd'hui du territoire traditionnel de nombreuses nations, inclu incluant les peuples Mississauga de Crédit, Anishinaabeg, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee et Wendat. Ce territoire abrite aujourd'hui de nombreux membres des peuples de Première Nation, Inuit et Métis. Nous reconnaissons et honorons les territoires traditionnels ancestraux sur lesquels nous vivons et travaillons, ainsi que la contribution de tous les peuples autochtones à nos communautés et à notre nation. Merci. Thank you. Miigwech. As Rich mentioned, I will provide active offer for any participants who wish to ask questions or have information relayed in French. Throughout the town hall, feel free to use the Q&A chat box to submit your questions for our panelists. Comme Rich l'a mentionné, je suis ici pour assurer une offre active à tous les participants qui souhaitent poser des questions ou se faire relayer des informations en français. Tout au long de cette séance de discussion, n'hésitez pas à soumettre vos questions à nos panélistes en utilisant la boîte de, de discussion questions et réponses. Enjoy your town hall. Rich? Thanks, Anne. I'm excited to hear from our guests today to learn more about their party stance on senior strategy. We know that working towards a comprehensive senior strategies at all levels of government will allow us as Canadians to remain independent, productive, and engaged members in our community as we age. A, a coordinator senior strategy will help to ensure income security and retirement through strategies such as expanding defined benefit pensions, also address the crucial issues of social isolation among older adults and support seniors to stay in their homes and communities throughout retirement, as well as combating age discrimination by enshrining the rights of older adults in a human rights framework. We have invited representatives from the four main parties to join us today to help us prepare for the upcoming Ontario election on June the 2nd. And we thank the three parties who kindly accepted our invitation and provided representatives to speak with us and to address our questions. Today, we have MPP John Fraser, representative for the Liberal Party of Ontario, MPP Sarah Singh, representing the Ontario New Democratic Party, and Matt Richter, Ontario Green Party candidate for Perry Sound Muskoka. In our discussion with the panelists today, we would like to know how will your party address age discrimination in public services and communities? And secondly, how will your party tackle rising social isolation and loneliness among older adults who struggle to routine to pre-pandemic activities? Each panelist will have 10 minutes to introduce themselves and speak about their party's position on the issue of ensuring that the needs of older adults are met. RTO, ERO members and guests 
please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions in English or French, and we will try to get to as many as possible following the presentations. We will start with MPP, John Fraser from the Liberal Party of Ontario. John? Okay. Alrighty. Um, okay. All right, great. Uh, now my camera's on. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, here today. I'm John Fraser. I'm the MPP for Ottawa South, also the Ontario Liberal Party health critic. A little bit about myself. Um, I have been working actually in this community of Ottawa South for almost 22 years in the community office that's now mine. My work has largely been centered around healthcare. That's why I'm the health critic for the Ontario Liberal Party. On uh, a personal level, I just uh, I, I think I'm senior right now, just going to be 63 uh, in a few weeks. And uh, so these issues uh, on a personal level are important for me um, as I head in that direction. But more importantly, um, I've been a, a caregiver and I'd say a care coordinator for uh, four of uh, parents, uh, two of my uh, four parents, my, my, uh, my mom and dad and my in-laws. Um, my mom is still with us, but I've been through a variety of healthcare issues and aging issues with them uh, over uh, over the last ten years. Uh, so I've experienced both home care, um, community care, uh, palliative care, and long term care. Um, and from the perspective of a, a public representative, it's given me um, a lot of insights into uh, the strengths and the things that we need to really work on and improve on, uh, especially with regards to healthcare. I would uh, like to address the uh, issue of isolation uh, right up front. I mean, I've always firmly believed, even before I got into politics, that uh, isolation is the greatest underdiagnosed underlying condition that affects people's health. And I think that you'll find that there is um, medical evidence and research uh, that, uh, that will tell you that. I know in the UK, uh, they essentially uh, brought it up to a cabinet level position. Uh, and recently in the legislature, uh, one of our colleagues, Lindsay Park, uh, who is sitting as an independent right now, brought forward a bill to call uh, on the government to um, create uh, a strategy around social isolation. Of course, it's not just uh, for, for seniors, uh, but we do know that seniors are um, overwhelmingly um, sort of dominant uh, in, that, um, in that group of people who find themselves in social isolation. The bill uh, passed unanimously, it's a, it's a second reading, it's a private member's bill. It's a bill that I obviously I supported uh, and that I'm committed to personally. Uh, I think it's something that we have to, uh, that we have to address um, and in working with uh, both community groups and municipalities uh, to address this. And there has to be a community-based solution uh, to uh, ensure that people uh, can live in community and be connected to community. I do, and I do like to say, even people who don't um, necessarily like other people uh, need other people to be around them. Uh, and uh, so it's a, a very important need that, that has to be met. So in the next few weeks, you'll see our um, uh, platform document coming out um, for seniors and, uh, and aging, uh, strategy for seniors and aging. Uh, I can't scoop that uh, platform in advance of that coming out, but I can talk uh, sort of broadly right now about the things that are, um, you know, the things you, you'll see in that in that document. And one of the most important things is uh, that people want to age in place. So uh, they want to be able to be um, living in the community, living in their homes uh, for as long as they can. Uh, and so what that means is uh, we actually have to have a home care system that uh, that works that delivers care to people and uh, and they can have a guarantee of ensuring that they're going to have the services that they need and, and you know one of the most important things around establishing um, a solid system of home care uh, is that we um, that we actually have a healthcare human resource plan right now we have um, an imbalance uh, between home care and long-term care and hospitals where home care, uh, home care uh, providers 
uh, are leaving uh, to go to long-term care and hospitals because uh, their compensation and their package is better. So we have to find a balance. We have to get a balance or equilibrium so that we can make sure that we have the people that we need in um, in long uh, in in home care, uh, and uh, um, and so we can actually deliver the services that are needed. Right now in Ontario, uh, there uh, the, the home care providers have told us that they are unable to fill about fifty percent of the appointments, and that's not uh, that's not right. Uh, also. It just makes smart uh, economic sense to try and help people stay uh, in their own homes uh, or living in community. Um, it does to send people to long-term care. I have people have to reside in long-term care because they have no other choice. Uh, and uh, and also part of that senior strategy too is um, you'll see is a drive towards um, we can't continue down the path uh, of uh, private uh, for-profit uh, delivery of care. Uh, I think it's very obvious through the pandemic that there's been some very serious challenges uh, with that. Um, you know, I like to say too that um, it's very hard to find um, community in private long-term care. Um, and we saw some of the results of the pandemic. So I think you'll see those uh, move towards that. And actually, across the healthcare system, there's a big push by the by the Ford government uh, to privatize as much of the system as they can uh, that they feel that people will tolerate. But what we end up we end up knowing is, at the end of the day, it costs us more money, uh, and we don't get a great quality of care. Um, just on on my own uh, uh, record of legislative record, I have a few bills that relate directly to um to seniors care um i have bill number four which is a long-term care commission report and uh, they're reporting on the long-term care commission report which the government hasn't done um they were supposed to respond uh to how far they got in the long-term care commission report and the 85 84 recommendations that were there uh, i have a bill that uh, ensures that workers uh, who are in retirement uh, and other kind of group settings um, are covered by WSIB uh, because many of them are not. Um, there are people who are doing the same work in long-term care uh, and provincially run um, uh, residential situations who, who uh, workers that is, who are, um, uh, who, who are covered by WSIB, but there's a whole group of workers who don't have that same kind of workplace protection. Um, I have a, a bill for 10 paid sick days uh, in the legislature, which again is driven towards ensuring that uh, workers can uh, have a um, workers in healthcare and other fields will have um, uh, have the kind of benefits that are necessary to keep them healthy and uh, and at work. And um, the last uh, piece I have is the um, patient bill of rights, which is which uh, establishes a bill of rights not just for. Um, not just for long-term care, but also for home care and for hospitals uh, that um, updates the Bill of Rights, which has been taken out of legislation, um, uh, is no longer there, but it updated the previous Bill of Rights and includes things like a right to an essential caregiver, which is a, a really critical piece, I think, uh, in aging and ensuring that people can um, have the kind of care that they need uh, and addresses isolation too, uh, because essential caregivers, uh, they're more than just visitors uh, and they, you know, they, uh, they contribute a great deal to the quality of life to the people who they are caregivers for. And as a result, uh, on an overall basis, are really important to a healthcare system. One so more minute, I'll, John. Uh, I was just gonna say, I'll leave it at that. I'll finish it in nine minutes. I could probably go on for the next hour, but uh, we get paid by the word. Okay, thank you very much, John. And now MPP Sarah Singh from the Ontario New Democratic Party. Sarah? 
Hello and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am uh, joining you from my uh, vehicle this afternoon. So uh, just a little indulgence from everyone, uh, but I am uh, joining you from the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the New Credit as well. And I'm honored to be here as a member from Brampton Center, uh, but also the New Democratic Party's critic for long-term care, home care and seniors. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, MPP Frazier, um, you know, just providing some of his perspective and, and the work that they've done and also the personal connection that I think a lot of us have to ensuring that the supports are going to be there for aging populations. Um, you know, for me, uh, I live in a multi-generational family. I grew up with my grandparents at home. Uh, my paternal and maternal grandparents uh, were very close to us. And uh, we watched them uh, go through uh, their life cycle. And I know that when we needed supports to ensure that, for example, my grandparents um, could stay at home and receive home care, uh, they simply weren't there. Um, you know, we know that uh, for many, many aging um, elders in our community, they want to age in place in their homes and with their families. Um, and that's why supports like home care are such a critical part of the equation. Um, as a millennial, I also have aging parents um, who are uh, in their early 60s. Uh, my mom will be turning 60 this year. And so it's not just about our grandparents, but it's also about our aging parents and the supports that we need uh, for, for all of them um, to continue to stay at home. I know with my grandfather's situation, um, you know, he had a uh, brain aneurysm and suffered a stroke. Um, that meant that he required 24 hours of care. Um, and unfortunately, our family did not receive those supports. Um, we were lucky if most weeks we got 12 hours of home care supports and often those appointments were canceled. Uh, that meant that my dad, um, also aging as well, had to step up to the plate and fill the gap to make sure that his father did not go without care. Um, and so for us, and, and for me, at least from a personal perspective, I realized there were many, many gaps and failures in the system um, very early on. And, uh, you know, my grandfather um, suffered a, a, you know, a stroke in, in 2017. And unfortunately, um, in 2019, he, he did pass. Um, but it showed me that there was a lot of work that needed to happen even before I got elected to improve uh, the supports for aging populations. I also uh, come from a community living background. I served as a board director for many years, uh, both at our local um, Brampton Caledon Community Living uh, chapter, as well as our provincial uh, network of Community Living Ontario. And so for me, I come from a, a place of understanding that large scale institutionalization of our communities is not the trajectory that we should be headed in and not where we should be pooling our investments. I believe that people deserve to stay in their communities and age in place and that we should be finding ways to create value and valorize people's roles um, through community supports um, rather than pushing people into large scale institutions like our long term care homes. And this is what was very shocking to me when the pandemic um, hit us uh, in early 2020 was that uh, it appeared that there were not the investments uh, over the last decade or so uh, made, that those investments were not made to help shore up places like our long-term care or home care or community supports. Um, and I think what we saw were the outcomes um, of a system in crisis um, unfold during the pandemic in long-term care um, and home care as well. Uh, where nearly 4,000 seniors and staff lost their lives um, in our long-term care homes because the supports and staffing resources were not there. The beds were not invested in. Um, and that meant that people, unfortunately, um, are aging and vulnerable community members because I think we have to be clear, it's not just elders that call long-term care home. It's also many people with intellectual disabilities um, who are forced into our long-term care homes as a housing solution that are living there. Um, and so over the, the, the last number of decades, those investments that needed to happen in our long-term care homes and in home care 
were not adequately done. And so when the pandemic happened, we saw the outcomes of that. Um, and that's why for us as New Democrats, we have been and we will continue to fight um, to actually invest in the type of care that we know people in our communities deserve, whether that's home care or investing in not-for-profit long-term care homes. Um, because we understand that the system is in crisis and we are going to be facing an aging population as well with our baby boomers. Um, but as we, we acknowledge the land to begin this conversation, I think it's important to acknowledge um, the seven grandfather teachings um, that uh, many First Nations believe, um, you know, should guide the principle of the work that we do and that they do as well. And the seven grandfather teachings remind us that we need to think not only of the current generation, but we need to reflect on seven generations in, in the past and the seven generations ahead of us. And so I use that as a guiding principle in the work that I do because it's not just about what we need to do right now, but it's about how do we transform and create a system that will support all of us as we age um, and as we need these supports in our community. That's why for New Democrats, um, you know, we have a platform and I'm happy to share that with you all if you haven't had a chance to look at it already, um, because we believe that aging Ontarians deserve the best. And that's why we are committed to transforming our um, long term care system to one that is um, a, a not for profit model, not one that is driven by profit for corporations. Um, but that also comes to home care as well, because we know that much of our home care system has been privatized. Um, and that's and that's also something that we need to uh, change, but also need to invest in to make sure that the supports are there. I know that many of my colleagues, uh, for example, um, have put forward private members' bills and motions. I'm proud to work alongside uh, many of, of our fierce uh, MPPs. Um, you know, I think of folks like Joel Hardin. I think of folks like Teresa Armstrong, Laura May Lindo, uh, Peggy Sattler, just to name a few that have all put forward uh, bills and motions to ensure that, for example, uh, as Lisa Gretzky did, uh, that essential caregivers will have access to their loved ones. Uh, uh, during a pandemic and otherwise. But for example, as Joel Hardin has uh, fought for uh, making sure that family members um, who are trying to access their loved ones and provide that support are not subject to, um, you know, trespassing charges when they uh, advocate on the beh behalf of their, their loved ones. Um, and so Vula's Law is a really important piece of legislation that helps address that. Peggy Sattler, for example, fighting for paid sick days alongside all of our NDP colleagues here because uh, we understand this important public health policy uh, would help protect us uh, during a pandemic, but workers deserve access to paid sick days. Um, we know that many workers in our home care and long-term care system did not have access to paid sick days. Um, and you know, many of them are precariously employed as well, often putting together two or three different contracts at, at multiple homes in order to make ends meet. Um, you know, that's something we need to address. And, and that's something we have definitely put forward legislation for. Um, and, you know, for example, the Time to Care Act, something that was introduced well before the pandemic, because we, we understood, uh, as Teresa Armstrong did, uh, some excellent work around this, um, that there was no standard of care in long-term care. Um, many residents were not receiving even two hours of care, um, you know, to do things like the daily basic living necessities that they needed to brush their teeth, get rest in the morning. Um, and that's why the Time to Care Act is such an important part of this conversation as well. Laura May Lindo, for example, uh, she's put forward legislation to ensure that there's a seniors, an independent seniors advocate here in the province of Ontario um, that currently does not exist. And so for many families and, and aging members of our communities, uh, they don't have uh, that voice that they need uh, to look at the situation independently or, or launch an investigation if they feel that there's some wrongdoing. Um, I mean, I could go on and on with the work that we have done as New Democrats to help fix a broken long term term care and home care system to provide the support with dignity that people in our communities deserve. Um, 
when it comes to mental health and isolation, I, I know my time is, is limited, so I'll just start to wrap up here. I see Rich has popped back on the mm -hmm. screen. Um, but, you know, when it comes to isolation, uh, this is something that as New Democrats, we are absolutely committed to addressing. And it means that, yes, we need to have a strategy, as John has pointed out, but it also means we need to provide the resources um, for mental health supports uh, for individuals in our communities, um, not just for young people, but for everyone, especially for our aging population. Um, so that when they need those supports, that they are there and they'll be made available to them. Um, I know we'll have a QA and a and, and there'll be time for a lot more discussion, but just wanted to share a little bit with you about, you know, a sort of where my positionality comes in, uh, the work that we're doing and the values that we have as New Democrats. So I'm definitely looking forward to this conversation and thank you so much for the opportunity for us all to connect today. Thank you, Sarah. And finally, we have Matt Richter, Ontario Green Party candidate uh, for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Matt? Thank you, Rich, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Richter, and I'm calling in from Port Sydney in the riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka. I'm a candidate and education critic for the Ontario Green Party, uh, but I do want to recognize that I am on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, specifically the Chippewa, the Algonquin, and the Ojibwe peoples. And I really wanna reaffirm our commitment to the calls to action and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and that we live as good treaty people. I, I'm a father of three. I, I own a small business up here in Muskoka uh, and I'm also a teacher. And I'm very fortunate to have both my parents in my life and, and my Opa still, who just recently turned 99. Very, very honored to have that just that good fortune. Uh, my wife and I, I'm a teacher and my wife also is a teacher. And you know, over the years, I, I wanna say that we've watched many of our colleagues exit the world of, of teaching and into the world of retirement. And I'm sure it was a bittersweet moment for them and for, for all of you tuning in today as well. I'm no doubt there are aspects of the job of teaching that you must dearly miss. And there must be some aspects that I'm certain you're very grateful to say goodbye to. And uh, dare I say the word EQAO? <laughs> uh, anyhow, I've, I have had the privilege though to run in the past provincial elections for the, since 2007. And I've also been the education critic for the Ontario Green Party since 2012. Um, you know, I'm really proud to always be on record of always putting people ahead of party. And that's a really critical piece of politics where we want to see democracy ahead of politics always being front and center. We will always have that unwavering commitment to work across party lines. But you know, unfortunately from one election cycle to the next, what I've noticed is that the same issues keep surfacing concerns around access to healthcare, the rising cost of living, a climate that is in crisis, and a lack of dignity for our seniors, our elders. And this is why we need a real plan with real action. And it's now more important than ever before, where the focus isn't on buying your vote, but really on earning your trust. And if we want a more caring Ontario that prioritizes the well-being of elders and the people who cared for our loved ones, it's gonna take a sense of urgency and political will. You know, here in Ontario, I think we have a perception problem when it comes to how we treat and care for our elders. We need to honor our elders in life. But forget saying new and improve. I like this line better that was shared with me recently by one of our volunteers. He said, forget new and improved, let's say old and improved. Let's look out to our indigenous communities as well up here. I am. I'm in a riding where there are six separate indigenous communities and we often look to them for guidance. And you know, in those communities, it's where the elders are looked up to, they're respected. I also wanna call out on our perception here in Ontario that we have a crisis in terms of how we perceive those who are aging into their elder years. And it's in within the TV and film industry. Do you know, just for point of record, there was a recent study that showed 5%, 5% or less of those who get a significant role in the film, 
or TV industry are 65 and over, only 5%. And unfortunately, what further to that point, a majority of those roles that our seniors receive in those aspects of, of that career of profession, if you will, in film and TV, a majority of those roles feature or showcase, if you will, elders with dementia who aren't capable of formulating thoughts. They are in, in positions where they may have different ways of, of not being able to conduct themselves. It's any, any way you look at it, the media has a significant role in improving how they, they view and they showcase our elders. So like that's that's one area that I think needs that perception aspect and a, almost a marketing aspect that often goes overlooked. When it comes back to our healthcare needs and when we're aging uh, and looking at what we need to improve the conditions of aging at home and just aging into our elder years, we need to commit to putting care and compassion over profits and recognize that a enormous and significant challenge that has been around in this area all along was around our nursing shortage and our shortage of our PSWs. And that was being driven by poor working conditions and low pay. We also need to ensure that we're looking beyond long-term care homes to models like aging in place and home care. And to that point, once people are into the place that they are in, as has been recognized so far, the, the issue of loneliness and recognizing that this is a, a significant, significant piece of the problem while we look at the mental health and well-being of our elders. It's important to note too that we must be recognizing mental health as health. And I'm really proud of the Ontario Green Party and led by Mike Schreiner leading the charge and putting the first standalone paper ever in Ontario's history on mental health and addictions and calling out for expanded OHIP coverage of our mental health services. You know, I know that we all have been touched with different areas, uh, whether it be directly in our family or those that we know who have needed mental health support. And unfortunately, even in my role as a teacher, I have noticed that it hasn't been getting better. And the students who receive who need to be receiving that mental health support can be put on long, long wait lists. And when we look at the other side of life and we look at our elders who need that support, they too are on wait lists. That is completely unacceptable. So expanding that OHIP care to, to, to ensure that we're covering the mental health needs is vital. My OPA who recently turned 99, he worked up to the age of his mid eighties and now over the past 15 years, he's watched himself, he's felt himself become a burden on society as he's watched his level of care and his level of need not be rewarded and not be honored. And it's really difficult. I'm sure we've all been in this position to, to watch that happening. He now needs a space, you know, not in his house. That's not gonna work anymore. But the problem is, we can't find a spot for his long-term care needs because there isn't anything available that would work within budget and within what he, within his geography. You know, and when it comes to housing though, there are those when we think of other options and how we can move forward, that we have to ensure that the housing there is available, that it's connected to the places we love, that it's affordable and sustainable. We have to be able to connect with friends and family. I'm a really proud proponent though of a, an option that comes up in housing as we get older, to be a proponent of co-op housing. I hope we can all get behind this. We've seen this model work so well in other jurisdictions of the world. Denmark, for instance, is a fantastic place where you see what can be done in such great areas of need for, for their seniors and how that has rewarded them so much. On top of that, we have to ensure that we have the role of the government prioritizing housing over unnecessary bills, which I hope to talk to later, because the government has a role in providing that housing. And lastly, I, I wanna make sure that we're looking at our role as stewards of the land to address the climate crisis. 
and ensuring that the climate crisis can be addressed, but we can still succeed together and to make sure that our, our income security can be part of tackling the climate crisis. Unfortunately, so far too in the past, we've watched some of our income security through our pension years be profited off of things that are causing the climate change itself, especially in the fossil fuel industry. You know, moving forward, regardless how we, we see our different views, I know by through collaboration and through working across party lines and ensuring that we're really putting the people that are in that need as a priority, that that is the way we move forward. We move forward by addressing the concerns in a real and practical way. And that's why I'm, I'm so proud to be with the Ontario Green Party and I'm thankful for all of you joining in today. And I'm ready to work and the Ontario Greens are ready to work across party lines to address these situations and issues and make Ontario a more caring place for all. So thank, so you, thank you all everyone, miigwech, and I look forward to, to being part of the conversation. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, Jim? Yeah, Ani, Bujo, Mego. It's um, a delight. I'm Jim Grieve, the uh, CEO of RTO. And what a thrill to have uh, John and Sarah and Matt sort of lay out some of their part of party perspectives on really, really deeply important issues to our members and to seniors really across this province and certainly to the many that have joined us today. <clears throat> I need to tell you that there are um, loads of questions coming in, so we'll be getting to those shortly, uh, but I do appreciate very much that Matt and John and Sarah have taken a real uh, major part of their day today to, to join us and join the members that are, um, are ready to ask them questions. I do want to start though by reminding you that we are able to take your question in English or in French, and I'm going to ask Anne um, Gerson to uh, just repeat that en français, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Jim. Ben, à nouveau, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Vous pouvez poser vos questions en français mm -hmm. ou en anglais en, en utilisant la boîte de questions et réponses au bas de votre écran. Si vous souhaitez que votre question soit posée à un panéliste spécifique, veuillez l'indiquer. Nous ferons de notre mieux pour répondre aux plus de questions possibles. Hello, everyone, again. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, we are still accepting questions, so please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions in English or French. If you would like your question to be asked to, of, um, to a specific panelist, please indicate that. We will do our best to address as many questions as we can. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. So let's begin. This is uh, going to be exciting. Uh, there's no question that we're going to wade right in on some really challenging issues, not the least of which uh, relates to some of the special needs that abound in the seniors population. We have a couple of questions that I'm going to combine, if you will, uh, and it relates to adults with developmental delays or developmental needs. And one of the suggestions is that, you know, in many cases, uh, probably the better way to deal with, with uh, adults in that circumstance is to purchase larger homes in the suburbs, have maybe five or six or eight um, attend in a household with support, uh, and create this kind of family type arrangement that really has given, as the questioner says, a, a degree of happy independence to those who can use it and has benefited both neighbors and residents. I guess the question I would ask of all of you, and I'll go to you, Sarah, first, if you don't mind, you know, what kind of plans does the NDP party have for seniors in the developmental sector? Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you for the question. Uh, you know, such an important one. Um, as the NDP, uh, we understand that um, seniors, people with uh, developmental disabilities uh, deserve to stay in their communities and live independently. I also have a sister with uh, a Down syndrome as well. So this is a, a very personal uh, concern for me. And, and for some time, I also served as uh, the chair of our housing uh, board uh, with Brampton Caledon and community living. So creating spaces in our communities that where people can live independently is something that we need to be doing. And it's something that the NDP is absolutely 
completely committed to. Um, it is a part of our housing plan to actually create assisted living um, homes and supportive living homes for people with developmental disabilities, as well as our aging population. I think when I speak to parents, especially of uh, individuals with a developmental disability, um, they are very worried that there are no real community uh, housing options for their loved ones and for their children. And the concern becomes as parents who have been primary caregivers for many of their children with a developmental disability, as they age as well, um, they are very worried that those supports will not be there for their children. And so we are committed to building the housing, um, but also looking at innovative solutions. I know that there are models, um, for example, in dementia care um, around creating villages of supports for people, um, that we need to look at some of those best practices and, and ensure that people with developmental disabilities can also live in their communities. The issue that we often run into, and you know, I'll speak frankly, is, is the nimbyism. I know we dealt with some of this here in our local community where folks don't want to see people living um, independently in their communities. Um, there is a lot of stigma, unfortunately, that still exists around supporting aging people with developmental disabilities. So I think we have a lot of work to do to help local municipalities um, with zoning, uh, to make sure that they're able to get the supports that they need to create these spaces in the local community and deal with some of the community backlash as well. So for us as New Democrats, we understand that this needs to be a part of the housing solution. This isn't just about long-term care and home care, um, but understanding that housing and providing the supports for um, people with disabilities to live in their communities is the way that we're actually going to ensure everyone has uh, access to a place to call home, but that they're living supported and independently as well in their communities. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Matt, do you want to weigh in? You were talking a little bit about co-op housing. I'm wondering on the same question though of developmentally delayed adults, the kind of housing that we can uh, put in place from the, uh, the Green Party's point of view on this. Yeah, it, cer certainly. And, and the Ontario Greens, and just jumping off of Sarah's points there, um, very connected in terms of where we're looking at being part of the solution with bringing in affordable housing, assistive housing, uh, permanent housing for with, with what we call wraparound support so that we can have people who do need uh, that type of assistance, but also living with those who can also provide. And there's so many different examples out there. Um, you know, I, I would also like to just back up really quick that, again, it's a bit of a marketing problem. As Sarah said, like this nimbyism, this is where the government, but society too, we have to be all in this together. And I know it's not nimbyism and it's a bit, um, it's a bit trendy to say, yes in my backyard, but sure, whatever works, like hashtag yes in my backyard, we, we need to be part of that. And, and the government has a role in marketing why this is so necessary. Um, and also the government has a role of, of looking at land planning act and, and making sure that the municipalities are, are encouraged, incentivized, and I don't wanna say forced, but, but they, they need to be part of the, the solution. And when we look at jurisdictions around the world, and I bring up, Jim, as you said, uh, the co-op housing model in Denmark, and I don't wanna keep bringing up Denmark because there's other jurisdictions in the world, but that's precisely what they've done. Um, they have a house or a, a building where everybody has their own unit, but it might be a shared communal space that's accessible for all. And the support is there for those who need it. Um, but it's not all, and this is based on good practice from community living centers. It's not that every person in uh, a particular housing unit would be all with perhaps a form of a disability. It would be, um, you, you would obviously mix. And one of the things in Denmark that they were doing was they were pairing up university students who needed a place to live for, for uh, attending. Now, this would obviously be only in jurisdictions that have universities or colleges. But imagine you had university students also sharing shared space with our elders. Um, and, and that was part of the, the model there as well. But the co-op housing is, it affords dignity and it brings integrity into this, uh, the housing situation here. Uh, sometimes we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I'm sure John, you have experience hearing of lots of other um, examples of best practices around the world, but we need to, again, get politics out of the way and, and get on with bringing this, like the solutions that are already there. As we say in politics, the solutions are at the doorstep and uh, we just need to get on with it. Thank you, Matt. I love the intergenerational concept as well. Uh, John, we'll let you weigh in on this uh, 
questions well. Oh, you're on mute, John, sorry. Mute myself. Um, uh, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, you know, I've been uh, you know, working in a community office uh, for about 23 years. It's been mine for the last eight. And one of the things that's, uh, that's hardest uh, is um, when you meet a family who have been have a son or a daughter who they've been living with and caring for in their in their late uh, 70s or 80s or sometimes 60s and they're concerned about how um, they've asked almost for no help um, but they come to a point in their life where there's um, they're concerned about their own health uh, or they may be alone they may have lost one of the partners and it becomes um, a really difficult situation and we only react in a crisis you know we have to um, get ahead of that being into crisis. And, you know, as Matt said, you know, we have to adopt uh, some policies that allow to people to live in the community. And we did have a program, a, a name that I can't remember. Uh, uh, I think it was essentially a, the exact name. It was a home share program, which allowed an individual who wanted to um, uh, bring someone um, or live with someone in their home, uh, an adult with a developmental disability, that we, there was an arrangement that, that would, uh, uh, they would be able to provide the government provides support for them to be able to do that. It's not a solution for everybody because there are different levels of different levels of need, and so it's um, you know it's it's a problem that we uh, that we have to address through housing. Uh, I think also through enabling those families uh, who um, who are able to uh, to um, um, have purpose built. Um, I've had a number of families come forward. Uh, who wanted to build some homes um, in communities and neighborhoods that were purpose built specifically for their four or five sons or daughters, and they come together. And sometimes as governments, we make that really difficult for people, both at the provincial and the municipal level. Um, and so, uh, so you know, housing is a solution to that. I mean, you know, one of the things, and Jim would be aware of this, is that is is the post eighteen challenge that we have for developmental disabilities and how people yep. fall off a fall off a cliff uh, and it's not just from schools right it's um it's it's healthcare. i was talking to a constituent the other day about uh, uh, their son who's having a challenge finding a primary care physician so it's um um we have to start a little earlier on than when they get when 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 seniors become seniors right so we um um i think that's you know, making sure that we that we're connected to those people in some meaningful way uh, through their lives, so we know where they're at. So, again, so you don't have a family that is coming to you in their greatest hour of need, so you can anticipate uh, and try to find some solutions for them. That's one of the, the disconnects that's there. Is uh, yeah, it's um, um, it's not for, it's it's a very hard thing to um, uh, obviously experience as a family. Um, and as a, as someone who helps try to help people solve those problems, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's the kind of thing that keeps you awake at night, right? Which is yeah. someone has a son or daughter that they desperately need to find a place for them because, uh, they can't care for them anymore. Is there, there, I want to say, that, uh, because of their age and their, their living circumstances. John and Matt and uh, Sarah, thank you. You you are in an RTO, ERO, and friends um, meeting, so no surprise that the first question would be one of those big challenging issues that that uh, has defied uh, definition and solution for so many years. So thank you for wading in on that. That was really good. Nous avons une question. We have a question in French, and I'm going to turn to and just saw to uh, read the question and then tell you exactly what it means on Anglais. Yes, merci Jim. I will start so by reading the question in French and we'll translate it into English afterwards. Um, quelle mesure est-ce que votre parti compte mettre en place afin d'assurer des services en français auprès des francophones à travers le système de santé et surtout les soins aux personnes âgées? So what measures does your party intend to put in place to ensure French language services to francophone throughout the healthcare system and especially in senior care? So feel free to respond in French or in English. Um, maybe 
Matt, if you could if you could start. In English, please. So not to pass the buck, but this might be, you know, not, not the failing of the Ontario education system, but I did take French all the way through and I think it's more just nervousness. And so I'd, I'd prefer in English, please. Um, maintaining and, and prioritizing French language services throughout, um, of, of course, is, is a, a number one issue here in the riding I'm at in Paris Saint Muskoka, um, but throughout Ontario, of course, and um, ensuring that we always are looking at, at how that, if there is failings in that, that that's being addressed. And unfortunately in past governments that we see is sometimes we may say one thing that yes, we honor and we respect the French language and it should be embedded throughout but it's not being enforced and why that is, or enforced it's not being followed through on. So in that, that comes down to priority and to, to commitment. Um, but I'd be the first to, to say, well, not the first to say, but um, it absolutely needs to be a vital component to, to everything that's been outlined. It, it becomes for, I think for many of us, when we look at the big picture, it, it, it's about the funding to, and the personnel to enforce and to follow through on actually doing this. And, and that funding needs to be there and that needs to be the priority um, for an issue like this. Merci. <laughs> um, John, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Merci. Uh, je sais en français et, uh, et utiliser anglais comme uh, j'ai perdu un mot. Uh, <laughs> et uh, c'est les, um, les droits linguistiques dans le soin de santé est, est très important. Et notre parti um, a un bon record de uh, protéger le, les droits linguistiques et um, uh, les, um, uh, maintenant, uh, le parti uh, va uh, rétablir les commissaires uh, the uh, commissaire uh, um, uh, de service uh, de service en français uh, indépendant indépendant c'est le gouvernement de Ford de couper cette position c'est très important pour une um, une vue indépendant uh, 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 à propos de uh, le, le service en français c'est dans le soin de santé dans particulièrement dans les uh, les uh, uh, la maison de, uh, du long durée, c'est beaucoup de personnes âgées uh, retournent de um, uh, nos, um, uh, leur uh, première uh, langue. Et uh, particulièrement le, les uh, patients qui souffrent de la démence, uh, les, démences, les démences. Et, um, et je, I'm going to switch to English now. It, it, it is very important that we designate uh, um, 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 beds uh, in long-term care that ensure uh, that the francophone population uh, will be served and can have be offered services in French. Um, uh, we have to expand beyond the designated areas in Ontario that we have uh, for um, uh, French language and it's it, it's um, French language services and it's it's you know it's been a particular we challenge, you know, it's, it's just been a struggle all the way along uh, to uh, continue to increase those rights uh, in healthcare. We're committed to doing that. We, you know, we've, um, uh, we were the party that uh, brought uh, the French Language Services Act uh, and a number of other initiatives to ensure the raisons to ensure that French language services were available, uh, particularly uh, in healthcare. Good. Sarah. Would you like to respond on this? En anglais ou français? 
OK, merci. Je vais essayer en français, mais euh, comme euh, Matt, euh, j'avais appris mon français ici, so j'excuse si je um, euh, utilise quelques mots en anglais aussi. Euh, oui. Mais je comprends que c'est un gros problème euh, autour de province que des gens qui veulent euh, recevoir des services en français euh, ils ne reçoivent pas des services quand euh, on pense de des gens âgés. Um, ça, c'est un, un gros problème même dans mon comté de Brampton Center, uh, j'avais uh, uh, rencontré des um, jeunes âgés uh, qui parlent français, ils sont des francophones, ils ont dit à moi qu'on n'a pas des services en français ici um, dans nos soins de longue durée pour des gens âgés. Uh, et ça, c'est un gros problème. Comme John avait dit, quand des gens um, you know, deviennent âgés, des choses comme dementia ou, ou des autres... Um, choses se passent et, et des gens veulent recevoir des services dans une langue qu'ils sont um, uh, familières avec. Uh, Qu'est-ce que des gens disent à moi ici, c'est que ce n'est pas juste dans le système de soins de longue durée qu'ils ont besoin des services en français, mais c'est même dans tous les services que des gens veulent uh, avoir Uh, comme pour leur santé, uh, même des uh, services pour la santé mentale, pour exemple, c'est pas en français. Uh, ça, c'est quelque chose que uh, on, on doit des investissements. Uh, même comme des gens dans mon comté avaient dit, c'est pas juste dans le nord ou auprès de Ottawa qu'on veut des services en français. On veut que ces services sont uh, dans toute la province et uh, 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 que des gens qui sont âgés pour recevoir des services, même s'ils ont euh, habité au Brampton ou à, à le Nord. Um, and so uh, I'm going to switch to English just to make sure I'm getting these points clearly across. But, um, you know, I know that this is a, a very big problem for uh, our aging community um, because the French language services that they expect will be there are simply not. Um, you know, last week I actually met um, with an action group on French language health services um, for seniors here in Peel. And they made it very clear to me that those services just simply don't exist. Um, there is uh, at best one a uh, partnership here in the Peel region um, at Credit Valley uh, Hospital, uh, where if seniors would like to access French language services, this is where they are being sent. Um, that is really not, um, I think, fair for seniors in other parts of our region, again, to have to transfer out of our community in order to receive the healthcare services that they deserve. And, you know, many seniors made it clear to me that it wasn't just about receiving a culturally appropriate care in, in long-term care, but the conversation needed to be about all of the supports that aging community members, uh, Francophone community members needed. Um, that included home care and that also included their mental health services. So as New Democrats, um, we have committed to investing in ensuring that French language services are a priority throughout all of the um, services people need to access. Um, we will, uh, during the election, um, just to sort of give a plug, have a, a platform piece around French language services um, because we understand the importance of this. Um, but it's very much connected to ensuring people have access to culturally appropriate care. And we know that uh, access to French language services is a right. Seniors have shared some simple suggestions, uh, you know, in terms of making sure that they have access to those services, things like making sure that maybe on their OHIP cards, for example, that they're noted down as, as bilingual so that perhaps they are prioritized for French language services. Um, simple solutions like this could help us ensure that our aging community is getting the services that they need in the languages that they desire as well. And that's something that New Democrats are committed to. So je remercie pour la question parce que c'est un très important question et uh, je m'excuse si j'avais fait des erreurs dans mon français, mais uh, j'avais essayé uh, de parler avec vous dans cette langue. Thank Merci you all beaucoup. three. Merci. Uh, Jim, uh, can I take just one second, just maybe to, uh, to summarize mm -hmm. what Matt said, because I think Sarah and John, you pretty, you know, repeated or explained, you know, what you said also in French and in English. Oui. Um, So, euh, pour les francophones, donc, euh, euh, Matt Richter nous a, nous a expliqué que, que pour son parti, c'est vraiment important le service en langue française. Euh, 
c'est même essentiel de pouvoir se faire et d'accéder aux soins en langue française. Euh, évidemment, euh, à côté de ça, bah, il faut que le financement et aussi que le personnel suive. Ça aussi, il a, il a été très, très spécifique là-dessus. Euh, il dit que ce n'est pas toujours pratique, évidemment, euh, d'avoir les, les services en français comme les deux, deux autres personnes. Euh, il dit que l'offre n'est pas toujours là, mais que finalement, c'est vital de l'avoir. Uh, and I would just add, um, um, John also um, in French said that um, the current government, they cut off the, the, the post of commissioner of French languages um, and um, the, liberal, the liberal party um, would like to reinstate it because it's quite important for, for the Francophone um, to have that, that watchdog. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. And thank you all. And a product of good French immersion speaking there, I think. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask Rich to join in in a moment because I want to talk a little bit about uh, defined pensions, Rich, when we come to you. But there's a, a question um, that came up uh, that sort of leads into that. Uh, and the quite a little bit of a lead into the question. A person is reporting that they worked for quite a number of years until they could no longer work, uh, this time in education. And uh, unfortunately, we're not able to, we're not in a position to buy back pension for those unpensionable years at that point, or pensionable years, sorry. So this is a person who lives alone, who was never married, and is now really struggling uh, with a pretty limited pension, very limited pension, um, and trying to sort of make her way through life with serious health issues, et cetera. So this really comes down to you know, what are the issues related to affordability to, for seniors that are deeply important to each of your parties? And then maybe I can come back, Rich, and let you weigh in on defined benefit pension plans and uh, how important they are to uh, anyone who happens to have the good fortune to have one of those. So uh, can we weigh in? And maybe, John, I'll turn to you and then Matt and, and then Sarah. I'm on mute again. Sorry. Thanks a lot, Jen. Uh, look, you know, I think that uh, that income security uh, is. Um, I can remember back to 2014 when uh, we tried to uh, establish in Ontario, or we were going to establish uh, our, an entire retirement pension, uh, ORPP uh, pension plan, uh, just simply to make sure that people wouldn't fall between the cracks. And if we take a look at uh, our challenges right now around, um, you know, we have the challenge of seniors who don't have an adequate income. Uh, uh, and it's combined right now with uh, workers who uh, don't have a future with an adequate income. And that's causing uh, challenges around uh, retention, people staying in fields like healthcare, like PSWs, like uh, RPNs, um, that there is a, um, um, that there's a shift towards those you know, uh, in those professions towards areas where uh, there is good benefits and good pension plans, hospitals mostly, and a bit in long-term care. Uh, um, you know, developing um, uh, a, um, um, uh, a strong um, base of income security uh, by, you know, in um, incenting employers um, to create pension plans that, that will last. You know, there are some challenges uh, that, that will last and will be effective uh, and understanding that people need that so that they're able to, uh, to, so that, you know, it's in our own interest to do that, to have a stable workforce uh, for those things that we need to be doing like uh, in schools, in hospitals. Um, so it's, um, uh, it, it is a, a, a particular challenge. Uh, and then there becomes some rules inside pensions as to how uh, people can again buy back, or how people can unlock things that they have, um, that you know, it's a bit in the weeds for me, so I won't go into it. Uh, but it's having a stable, reliable income uh, in uh, as you you know as you age or as you after you retire is critical to this quality of life. Thanks, John. Matt. No, yeah, thank you for this question and just bringing up this issue because so often in in life, teachers are viewed as the, having these 
just phenomenal pensions and they are good pensions, but there's this perception in society that teachers have it so good. And when people get to that point where um, they're in their retired years that they shouldn't complain at all. You know, and it's really unfortunate that there is that perception out there. And, um, you know, when we look at that, even as an aside, a good, a good pension plan should not be looked at as a crime. Yet it feels like in society, there's so many people who ridicule teachers as to having it too good, right? But we're coming up with a situation here where clearly somebody wasn't able to, to buy back their pension years. And now they're in a position in life where it's, their income's not meeting their cost of living. And this is where they need, they need support to help maintain their way of life, but make cost of living less. And, and what are we looking at here before we look at adding in new pension or adding in from an Ontario point of view, going back to the discussion of the Ontario registered pension plan, what are some other things we can be looking at? Well, lowering the cost of transportation, ensuring that our communities are livable and connected, where the cost of moving around is less because perhaps you're, you're, live, you're able to live in an area where, where you are not having to use as much transportation, but perhaps in this situation you need to have transportation. Well, the cost of gas, as we all know, is, is beyond affordable. So this is why we're really proud to commit to, to incentivizing electric vehicles and the infrastructure required to really cut down on that cost of transportation with our call to action is a $10,000 rebate on an electric vehicle on top of the federal. That would help. It would also help by making sure that people have a place to call home <laughs> and, and that it's an affordable place instead of prioritizing things like what the conservative government's talking about with this massive highway at the tune of eight to $10 billion to pave over the Holland Marsh and to go north of the 407 we could be using that money to help people getting into affordable housing and you know and also within under ohip it's really unfortunate that certain things cost money you know there was uh, somebody i was just talking to at the door the other day they were sharing with me their their optometry bill and even though they were proud that their optometry bill is covered now but there's certain things that are preventative that aren't and it was uh, she was sharing a digital retinal scan yep. that can actually detect onset of glaucoma well that wasn't covered so that's 50 dollars. this person could afford it but they're saying you know what if somebody already had glaucoma and were all like perhaps unfortunately had glaucoma and they were in their 50s that would to see an optometrist is covered yet how backwards is our system that a preventative measure under ohip isn't covered in terms of having a diagnostic exam like this it's a bit backwards there um, but then just, John, to go back to your point about the Ontario Registered Pension Plan, I think when government calls on the province to help out with adding in something like that, it's fair enough. But then the province also has to show, and this is, uh, this is straight back from the business owners, the small and medium-sized business owners, they need support in order to make a new pension plan exist and viable. You know, business owners throughout Ontario were sharing with me, yeah, they liked the idea of the ORPP back in the day because it would have afford that security and reassure their employees of, of a pension plan on top of CPP. But the, the businesses were saying, how are we going to do this? How are we going to afford matching contributions? It, it, would, it was really unfortunate how that was perceived by the business because they saw that this being an unaffordable, unmanageable way of, of doing it because they couldn't afford to do that. So as long as there's open communication and the government support, then absolutely. Um, but I think small businesses and medium-sized businesses felt like they were being targeted as being a solution, but not being able to afford the solution. Um, but the Ontario Greens, again, always talking about looking at best, best ideas and, and just sensible ways forward of of where our priorities are at. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Sarah, would you like to weigh in on this thorny issue? <laughs> Absolutely. I'll just uh, add some thoughts here. Um, I think, you know, what I hear from our aging community members is that life is getting harder and harder, even if they have a, a pension in place. Um, for many of them, 
the cost of living um, is is impacting them detrimentally because, you know, with inflation um, and all of these other expenses that they are now incurring, what they thought they had available is becoming a, a smaller and smaller amount to actually make ends meet. And so, you know, for us, uh, we I think similar to uh, sort of Matt's uh, sort of framing around uh, the cost of living and looking at what other supports need to be provided for our, our seniors and those with pensions, um, you know, to ensure that uh, they they can enjoy those those years um, of retirement years. So, you know, when I'm out in our community, I hear from folks that the cost of housing is increasing. Um, so, you know, the, whether they're renting or whether they have a mortgage on their home, it's becoming unaffordable for many. Uh, many of our aging community members are worried um, that being on fixed incomes means that they won't be able to keep up with those payments. Um, and they're very worried uh, that they may be at risk of losing their home, you know, what is their biggest asset, for example. Um, and I don't think that our aging community members should have to have that burden placed on them that, um, you know, what they've worked for their entire lives is at risk of disappearing and putting them into a very precarious situation. Um, you know, when I speak to community members, they're sharing with me and we're all experiencing this, um, you know, the cost of food is going up, the cost of hydro is going up, the cost of of, um, of all of our expenses, auto insurance is a big one out here for us. Um, and, uh, you know, these are things that I think that the government can also work in in tandem with increasing uh, the way that the pensions are, are funded, but also looking at how do we reduce some of those costs that our aging community members have to incur in, in their, you know, what should be their golden years. Um, and what I've heard from, from many folks is um, once they are retired, um, that you know, sort of um, golden egg that they thought they had uh, is not going to stretch as far. Those dollars are not going to stretch as far as they would have hoped. And so now they're, you know, pinching pennies. Some are making really difficult decisions um, between, for example, housing and heating, eating and heating. Um, those are not things that seniors should have to be worried about at this point in their life. And I think that the government uh, of Ontario and as New Democrats, we've committed to stepping up to the plate to ensure that there's fairness, there's balance, and that the supports that aging seniors need will be there. Um, and we can do that by reducing some of the... Oops. We're going to move on, Sarah. We've lost you briefly. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn to Rich. Uh, Rich, uh, we're back to this whole notion of income security. And as Matt was saying, there's much or many mixed messages about defined benefit pension plans. Can you just give a little bit of a an explanation as to where we're going with all of this? I uh, certainly can, Jim. And when we're talking about a pension, recognize that it, in reality, it's merely a deferred salary. That is what a pension is. Individuals who are receiving pensions pay for it all their working life, as does their employer with respect to that. And we're fortunate enough, most of us that are members in this group, we have a defined benefit pension with respect to that. But unfortunately, that number is getting fewer and fewer in the workforce. And it's down to somewhere in the vicinity of about 17% have a defined pension, uh, benefit pension with respect to that, because uh, some governments, not necessarily Ontario, but some governments are trying to put into place uh, defined contribution pensions, defined uh, target pensions. Some are moving towards annuities as a means so that it takes all the emphasis off the employer and puts it solely on the back of the employee with respect to that. And when pensions first started X number of years ago, uh, people didn't expect to really uh, receive a pension because unfortunately they passed before uh, the age of 65 with respect to that, if not age 70. Now, uh, I know from Ontario Teachers Pension Plan that the average a uh, person is on a pension for 32 years. And that's why it may look good when it is uh, started, but it has to be indexed. Otherwise, if, you, if it's not indexed after uh, 30 years, you're gonna lose 60% of your pension. So therefore it's imperative that uh, everyone uh, ensures that we have a defined benefit pension here in Ontario. Uh, if you wanna read, what's going on in some of the places that don't. There's a book that was written by the CEO of uh, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan called The Third Rail. And it's uh, unfortunately not that great 
with respect to what's happening with pensions around the country in North America. That's it, Jim. Yeah, thank you very much, Rich. That's terrific uh, overview. And it really addresses some of that in income insecurity that's, uh, that's out there. And I'm gonna call on you in a moment uh, because nous avons une question français that really fits with this discussion and cuts right into the ageism that I think um, Matt was talking a little bit about, you know, aging actors not showing up in, in droves or not being hired in droves. But the question, uh, maybe you could read the question in, in French and in English, please. Oui, bien sûr. Um, la question est, quel programme mettrez-vous en place pour lutter contre l'agisme des aînés au Canada? What programs will you put in place to address ageism in Canada? So let's direct that. And uh, I, we may have lost Sarah briefly, but we'll, we'll leave uh, Matt on the hook first and then uh, John. <laughs> no, um, sorry. I just wanted to make sure I'm... To, to approach ageism is in, in our school system, it's uh, the same, one of the key strategies is the same strategy we use to look at any of the isms. And that's to address it, to acknowledge it and to call it out for what it is. And um, one of the pieces to the equation of, of solving uh, the issues around ageism and the, the detrimental effects is, it's literally within market, like uh, marketing and government dollars, uh, just the way the government spends on various campaigns and ads, it's to truly and meaningfully get the, the needle going to a, a level of more respect that other cultures share with their elders, is to ensure that uh, people are aware of the effects of it, the impacts of it, to hear the stories and to afford those stories and to, to fund um, media towards that so that people hear this and see what it is because there is there might be there is a stigma um, that needs to be addressed but there's also uh, just a huge amount of naivety and and um, ignorance towards this um, and, and it not not to fault people but they're just it's because of lack of exposure to that um, making age I'm calling out for somebody's age as a source of uh, of, of employment. Of course, th that's discrimination, and 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 you know there, there's provisions already in place that need to be strengthened towards that. Um, but at the same time, um, here in our community, in my riding, it's no different than anywhere else in Ontario. That that the the real life stories of, of people as they get older, thinking the only place that I can get hired at, you know, just for an employment example is the Walmart or the Home Depot. Um, and I'm gonna hand out a flyer while people walk in and I should feel good about that. Or, or you know, how, how degrading that is. And even in, in our education system, fighting for teachers to have the right to go back and, and do supply teaching and not where they feel like a burden because those teachers, and I saw this time and time again with retired teachers, they are not valued the way they should be. They are at the retirement party. I've been at far too many of those where I've watched colleagues of mine move on and never be tapped into a, as a resource going forward. It's just the back door hits them and they, we never hear of them again. We need to encourage in all sectors that our elders are brought back in to be consultants, to be mentors. And, and there's so many programs that can be creatively brought forward as long as the political will is there. Um, so it, it's a big multifaceted issue and um, you ra rather than singling out a policy, I, I think the approach of, of meeting it at where it's at as a, as a social perception and that everybody has a vital role in, in calling it out for when we see it and dismissing it just as we would in any other ism, um, that that's a good start and that's something that I think we would all be part of. Matt, all I would say on behalf of um, uh, RTO ERO is that retirees from the education sector, no matter whether it's childcare or K to 12 or post secondary, mm -hmm. they can find engagement and respect with RTO post retirement. So uh, we're doing our part, and I think our 82,000 members feel we're trying to do that part to make, make sure they're respected as, as aging seniors. John, and then uh, Sarah on this issue. Sarah, did you hear the question? Because we can come back to it. Okay, we'll tell it in a minute, but John, maybe you'll get it from John's answer. 
John, you're on mute, dude. <laughs> uh, je, je suis, euh, pardon, je, je suis en accord de, euh, avec Matt pour les, euh, les solutions. C'est une solution communautaire. C'est communautaire de, euh, de, de groupe de ret, retraite le, euh, et euh, les, 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 les groupes de la communauté euh, des endroits. Euh, C'est parce que dans les, euh, les, euh, les lois de droit, euh, droit euh, humain, les, les, euh, les discri discriminations euh, de, de large, de large et, euh, et euh, c'est un règlement, ce n'est pas, euh, pas euh, comment on dit, uh, you're, you're not allowed to discriminate uh, based on a person's age in human rights laws. Et, euh, et c'est le problème, ce n'est pas le, le loi, ce problème est le problème communautaire. Et, euh, et je pense, comme euh, l'âge de population euh, euh, âgée euh, augmenté dans les prochains euh, 10 à 15 ans, euh, Um, just, I, um, I'm going to go back into English here. I, I just think it, it, as we're go, I, I think people will, um, in a natural sense, um, be working longer um, because of the need to have skilled workers uh, who have experience. So we may see some of that ageism, uh, ageism drop. It's, it's an, you know, by necessity. Uh, it's an attitude, though. You know that that uh, too many people who I know have experienced. You know, just even in my, um, um, you know, even some of my friends who work in politics, been working for a long time. As they um, uh, as they get older uh, and into their sixties, you know, uh, it becomes very much a young person's uh, workplace. And sometimes uh, people are discount uh, are discounted in the sense that um, you're on your way out uh, when you have um, a great deal to offer. So I think, you know, and agreeing with Matt is it's, you know, we have to, uh, we have to elevate that uh, as, as communities and societies and as political leaders. You know, we have some laws that are already in place and the solutions um, I think are really community-based and creating um, 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 places um, uh, that support people. Um, Older workers, just like the retired teachers of Ontario, um, those kind of uh, groups, I think, are critical to um, not just protecting the rights, but giving people the community. Right. So it's it's not uh, it's hard to be isolated and feel like you are being discriminated against, and that you have no support uh, to um, defend yourself uh, against that discrimination. Yeah, you're right. It's uh, what we offer in many respects is something to combat social isolation so people feel yeah. part of a community. Um, Sarah, very quickly, this is about ageism in Canada and uh, age old thing. We're, uh, we're asking what each party uh, plans to do about trying to combat this. Thank you so much. And I just want to apologize. Um, I'm in the car. It's a beautiful day. So for yep. whatever reasons, my phone continues to overheat and bump me off the call. So I just want to apologize for missing a part there. Um, but I think uh, as, as John and uh, I believe Matt were uh, alluding to, um, you know, that we, we need to tackle um, sort of the ages um, that we know exists in our communities. Um, there is, um, unfortunately, uh, the notion that uh, as we age, we um, become less valued is one that uh, is unfortunately rampant in a, a lot of our communities. Um, and I think this is definitely a cultural thing in terms of how we see our elders and the contributions that they can make. Um, you know, when I think of how we address the issue of ageism, I think of, um, you know, social role valorization and how individuals continue to be devalued based on their what we believe is their economic contribution to our communities. Um, and I think we need to understand that people of all different abilities, uh, as well as our aging population, uh, deserve to continue to be valorized in our communities, continue to deserve to take up space 
spaces and should be, I think, respected for their contributions. I'm not sort of shunned to the side, uh, which is what we see a lot happening here. Um, and, you know, I, I can speak from my own experiences as well. Uh, you know, I come from a cultural community. Uh, the way we understand our elders and the role that they play in our communities is very different um, from, from others uh, as well. And so I think a part of this is addressing the stigma. Um, as John said, obviously, there are, are laws in place against uh, age, ageism, um, but we know that it's happening far too often. And so for us, it's, it's about finding ways to create value. Um, it's about, again, moving from models that are based on large scale institutions because people no longer can contribute to society to understanding that people deserve to stay in their communities. They deserve to be able to contribute to their communities um, and they deserve to live with dignity. So I think it's a very holistic approach that needs to be taken. Um, but it's also things like, you know, creating spaces for intergenerational um, exchanges to happen more effectively effectively as well, so that the next generation also values their elders um, in ways that currently are not happening. And so there's a huge disconnect between uh, different demographics of ages as well in terms of understanding the importance. So I think, you know, that's a small, a small step in the right direction. There are many models and uh, something that New Democrats understand as an issue and are working towards uh, building more inclusive and holistic societies all, all around. I think you're being very consistent, all of you, and particularly you, um, Sarah, because you mentioned the seven grandfather teachings. And, you know, the, the thing that I think we much lament in our society uh, that we've not learned from our um, uh, Indigenous populations is to value the elders in society as the keepers of knowledge and the keepers of stories. Uh, and, and I'm just going to go back to Anne and see if she can very quickly, because I'm watching the clock very quickly give a high level version of uh, what each of you said. <laughs> okay, merci Jim. Um, oui, les, nos trois panélistes sont d'accord sur le sujet. Principalement, uh, il faut s'attaquer au problème de l'agisme. Il faut valoriser le rôle des aînés. On sait que notre population vieillit. Donc, les aînés ont quelque chose à apporter à la population aussi professionnellement dans le monde du travail. Um, le respect fait partie uh, aussi des valeurs à, à mettre en avant. Uh, il faut s'attaquer aux problèmes. On a parlé, Matt a parlé aussi d'une campagne de sensibilisation, sensibiliser le public. Uh, parfois, parfois, il y a de l'ignorance par rapport à tout ça. Um, chaque, chacun des panélistes aussi a dit que la solution viendra aussi dans la communauté. communauté. Il faut travailler tous ensemble pour résoudre ce problème-là et pour sensibiliser les gens au problème. Et puis, euh, Jim, évidemment, a, a ajouté aussi euh, le rôle des aînés dans notre société, quelque chose de très important en règle générale. Voilà. Fantastic. Well done. See how well you said that, all of you, all three of you. Beautiful. Um, I'm just going to ask a question that is being raised time and time again on this issue. Um, and it relates to uh, personal service workers, PSWs. Uh, there are many questions on, uh, on our Q&A about those. I'm gonna ask those. And when we've gone through those, I'm gonna go to Rich and ask him to uh, pose the last question, but let's wade into uh, PSWs. Um, you know, the concept here is we understand PSWs are much misunderstood. They may need more training. They certainly deserve an awful lot more credit and a lot more pay. Uh, and and I, I think part of that is uh, support that's missing for this profession. And the fact that we had PSWs moving to multiple locations during the pandemic uh, absolutely became proved to be uh, sort of the the weakest part of, of uh, that process early on in 2020. So I'm wondering what each of your parties will do. And it's been, uh, man, I think PSWs and childcare workers have been terribly underpaid and undervalued for decades upon decades. What will your party do to raise that notion and, and bring PSWs, particularly who are serving in long-term care settings, uh, to that of a more of a professional. So uh, we'll go to, uh, um, sorry, Sarah, if you don't mind, and then John and then Matt. 
Absolutely. I appreciate uh, also trying to achieve some gender parity with the uh, responses. So thank you for that, Jim. Um, happy to you know, share a little bit about what New Democrats uh, believe in when it comes to our PSWs um, and the supports that they rightfully deserve. Um, you know, I just want to say, as we all know, caregiving is, is not an easy job. Um, being a personal support worker is a lot of hard work. It takes also a physical, emotional and spiritual toll on our frontline workers like PSWs. And so when we understand that um, the current system does not really value those workers uh, as a part of the equation, um, in fact, has devalued much of the work that they provide in our, in our healthcare system and long-term care system in particular, um, it's created a very precarious situation where private you know, operators have uh, prioritized their profits rather than reinvesting in care and paying workers like our PSWs fairly. Uh, that's why New Democrats, as I said earlier, we're committed to um, moving forward with things like the Time to Care Act, uh, as well as ensuring that we increase the wages for our PSWs and ensure that these are good paying jobs that are unionized with benefits so that we can attract workers to this sector as well. Um, these are important elements of addressing what is a staffing crisis right now in long-term care and home care, uh, where many are leaving the sector because they aren't being paid decent wages. They are forced to put together two to three different contracts in order to uh, at least earn a minimum uh, standard of living. Uh, it shouldn't have to be that way. And that's why we believe that with the right investments, uh, this can be a sector where we attract workers um, who want to care for vulnerable people um, and do that with, uh, with respect for them as well. Um, they should be able to earn a decent uh, uh, wage um, that they can take care of their own families with. Um, you know, I often hear um, from PSWs who are and were forced to work multiple contracts um, in order to be able to keep a roof over their heads um, and, and provide for their children. No one should have to fear that um, and, and have to work uh, multiple different homes in order to just at least earn a decent life, uh, a wage to have a decent life. And so that's why for us, we understand that it's about investing in the current PSWs that are working by increasing their wages, making sure those are full-time jobs um, with benefits for those workers, uh, but also ensuring that the skills development and training is there for the next generation of personal support workers as well. Um, I know that the government uh, has announced a number of different initiatives that tries to address the problem, uh, but it's really just a band-aid um, because we aren't really addressing the root of the issue. It's a retention problem that we're seeing in long-term care. Um, so, you know, folks that are in school right now need to ensure that their tuition is being taken care of, that they're being provided enough opportunity to work in the field as they earn uh, their respective degrees as well, um, but that they know that they will be entering a sector with good paying jobs um, and, and that that's something that they can build a career out of, not just do uh, to, to make ends meet in the short term. Um, but again, it comes down to investing in the system as a whole, fixing the problems that are causing people to leave the sector, um, but making sure that people know that there's some stability and sustainability in the sector moving forward as, as well for them. Um, I, I could continue going on. I know I've been rambling for a bit, but it's, it is a complex problem that requires a multitude of solutions to really get to the heart of what's happening and make sure that PSWs who are doing such a phenomenal job and put their lives at risk don't have to do things like fight for PPE when we have a pandemic. That shouldn't be a reality here for workers in Ontario. Um, and as New Democrats, we're committed to making sure that we fix what is a broken system. Thank you very much, Sarah. John? I mute myself first before I start talking again. So I got it right at least once. Yeah, no, what Sarah says is true. It's what it comes down to uh, is uh, giving people uh, an ability to you know, raise a family and thrive through the right compensation. And that includes uh, wages. Uh, you know, when we were in government, we did raise the wages of PSWs by $4 an hour. Uh, but that was uh, almost seven or eight years ago. They do need to have a, um, um, a raise in wages. But more importantly, working conditions where you're not um, uh, going to two or three jobs uh, that are unstable. Uh, the home care sector or the, the long-term care sector, um, it, it has a problem with retention. But it's in some ways much better suited. The, the wages are actually higher there. Uh, there tend to be more benefits packages. Uh, where, we're, where it's a really big problem right now is in home care. 
as I think I said earlier, that um, about 50% of people aren't getting their home care visits met in Ontario right now. And that's because wages are lowest in home care. The work is most precarious in home care. Uh, it's a really hard job. So we actually have to get to a point where a PSW is a PSW is a PSW so that they earn relatively harmonized rates across both hospitals, long-term care and, uh, and home care. Uh, because right now, uh, what's happening is they're all tilting towards the uh, the, the acute care sector and then long term care uh, to go for work because that's how they can uh, that's the best you know, place right now that needs to be better for them to be able to to uh, to raise a family and to have uh, a stable solid income uh, with things like pensions and some benefits. So I could uh, I want to least I know we want to get another question in so I'll cut it off there and turn it over to Matt. Great, thank you, Matt. Yeah, um, yeah, this is a critical crisis moment yet again, and it's unfortunately nothing new with how we treat our PSWs from one election to the next. You know, starting in my the third time I ran in 2014, I, I joined, uh, there was, a, you know, just an advocacy group for better conditions for our PSWs down at a main intersection in Bracebridge in our, in our riding. And that was, again, back in 2014. Well, here it is eight years later. And similar to our educational assistance in the school system, you know, on one level, they're so valued. People see how vital it is to have a vibrant and robust workforce with our PSWs and our educational assistants. Yet, how do we honor them with, you know, minimal pay and, and we, we dangle benefits in front of them? That, that's so disrespectful. And, you know, the other day when I was talking and we were doing a phone call with some PSWs, they, one near, basically broke down as they were saying, when it comes to home care, we're one phone call away from yet another, yet another crisis. And that's meaning that they're overworked. They're going to work even though they're exhausted. It's not safe. They're not getting their mileage covered, but they have to do it anyhow. And they know that if they don't go, that person who's relying on them won't see someone for up to two to three days. And that's not an extreme example. That's actually a very common example. And yet again, it comes back to saying, yes, we need to honor our PSWs with benefits and pay. But how do we do that? And it's a priority. So it was really upsetting to see a few weeks ago when Doug Ford announces a license plate sticker rebate program, yeah. that's going to take a billion dollars out of our government revenue. And we're going to hand that back to people, especially um, it's absurd when you think about some of the very, very wealthy people who have multiple vehicles that they're getting that money. And yet many of our vulnerable sectors receive nothing because they perhaps they don't even own a vehicle. Like that's shameful. But the point here is that that was a billion dollars that we could have just said basic crude math, we could have shifted a, a significant portion of that to, to honor a way of saying, here's how we can up benefits and pay for PSWs. It's something that I really value in politics is saying it's one thing to promise something, but at least let's not have a false promise by, by suggesting something where we don't really know how we can get that funding from. And I just use that as an example, not an overarching example. And I'm really proud, one more thing, that it was the Ontario Green Party leader, Mike Schreiner, who was the only one who voted against that license plate sticker rebate. I was just going to throw that in there. I know it's a little, a little bad politics there. But I, I had to <laughs> it's <that> okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. politics. Good for you. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to go to Rich, and he's got a question. Oh, you're on mute, Rich. Thank you, Jim, uh, for saying that. We've heard today and in previous days past that when talking about older adults, we often hear that in some cultures, they're highly respected as elders. We've also heard on the opposite perspective is that quite frequently uh, elders, uh, the older adults have been warehoused in certain uh, long-term homes, et cetera. And some provinces have a senior's advocate for uh, obviously the seniors in, in their respective province. How do you gain insights from older persons, uh, their perspectives on matters important to you in your constituency and in your party? And we'll start with, uh, firstly, we'll go to Sarah, 
Matt and John. Thank you so much, Rich, for the question. A really, really important one as well. And, uh, you know, I just want to say, Matt, it's politics. John and I, uh, we we do a lot of panels together and, and we get along just fine. Uh, and sometimes we do have to take a shot at each other every now and then. So nothing personal there. Um, but uh, appreciate appreciate the opportunity to just chat about how we have been connecting with our, uh, with our elders and our aging population here as the NDP and as a critic here. Um, you know, we when we released our um, aging uh, in place uh, platform, uh, Aging Ontarians Deserve Best. I just wanted to make sure I got the title correct there. Um, platform, we actually, you know, solicited quite a lot of feedback from uh, different stakeholders across the province um, to ensure that their voices were reflected in the document that we created and the platform that we've put together. Um, and that's something that we're committed to. So, um, you know, even after we released this, we were able to connect with individuals who said, hey, maybe you should try doing this differently. And that's criticism and discussions that we are open to and continue to listen to. Um, here in my local community, uh, you know, I connect with a number of our um, seniors clubs. We have a very diverse riding. Um, so we have everything from, you know, the International Punjabi Seniors Club to the Thummel Seniors to the Brampton Council of, of uh, Seniors as well. And so connecting with them on a local level allows me to hear these concerns and inform the, the work that we do moving forward. Um, as we head into an election, I just want to make sure everyone on this call uh, knows that, uh, you know, as your critic, uh, I'm here to listen to the to these concerns and make sure that we fix what is uh, clearly a, a broken system here in Ontario when it comes to supports for our aging uh, elders. Um, but I think as I've highlighted, um, you know, for us as New Democrats, some of the lived experience that we're bringing to the table, some of the conversations that we have as well, do inform the perspectives um, that we're, we're, we've put forward. As I said, for me, I come from a community living background. Uh, my PhD is in policy studies. So understanding the importance of the work that we're doing um, comes from a very critical place um, in understanding that there are systems that are broken and we need to work towards fixing that. But we can't do that in a silo either as a party. We have to work with all the different stakeholders uh, across the province to, to make sure that we are uh, reflecting the work that they all want to see happens. Um, I also think that it isn't just about one party, if I'm being very honest as well. I think we have to find ways to work together across the aisle and across our benches to make sure that, you know, the priorities that Ontarians want to see us fighting for is what we are working towards. And I think, you know, that's what we, and I, I'm sure John will share some of this as well, felt very concerned when we saw legislation, um, you know, from the Conservative government that uh, was meant to transform our long-term care system that really, in fact, did nothing to, to help do that. And I think um, that's why, as opposition members, we all rallied uh, together to say, no, this is not the right direction for the province, um, and there is a better way forward. Um, I think as New Democrats, we might be the only party that has fully committed to uh, transforming our long-term care system to one that is fully publicly funded and publicly operated. Um, feel free to correct me, gentlemen, if, if that's incorrect. But um, that is a really important part of this equation and what we hear time and time again from stakeholders and what I hear when I'm knocking on doors talking to our, our amazing elders is that they don't want to be warehoused. They don't want to see more tax dollars going into private shareholders pockets. Um, and that's something that we can fix and that we are committed to doing. So please keep getting in touch with us. Keep sharing that feedback. It's extremely important for us and, and we value all these insights um, from, from folks across the province. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's greatly appreciate. Uh, Matt, uh, what would you have to say on this perspective? So engaging with our elderly population and, and ensuring that their voices are, are heard in policy going forward that benefits them and future generations clearly is something that we, we prioritize as, along with any other party, I would hope. <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, how do we do that? And, and it comes from championing and fighting for uh, access to being able to do so, especially we saw this in, during the pandemic, but even before that, transportation sometimes can be uh, very problematic to get to different areas to be able to share, whether it be a town hall forum or just a group discussion. Uh, and this is why we keep putting it out there, why it's so necessary for the investments in rural broadband and getting our internet infrastructure up. We've done so many town halls over the past two years um, leading up to this election to ensure that their voices are being heard and, and how that works going forward and seeing how that also connects 
to other aspects, even when it comes to our healthcare and the vital role that telemedicine is going to be playing to, to ensure that they realize there's so many there's so many moments, unfortunately, where people in their elderly years can't get to different appointments, but with the right necessary investment, telemedicine is not going to replace, of course, healthcare, uh, the human to human interaction, but it can play a vital role in, in bringing some more accessibility to that experience. Um, you know, and, and also it, it comes to just basic social gatherings and, and, and getting rid of, of the, the things that are preventing loneliness. Like we need to move beyond the, the, the factors that have led to loneliness. And so often our communities are disconnected and we need land planning and our communities being built so that they are walkable, they're livable, they're connected. People can get to the places they need to with reliable and affordable transit that you know, that within our communities, there are walking trails to get to, that there are these social opportunities that are, uh, that are afforded and, and put in place. Um, so all of that is, is a part of the lifestyle that we need. Um, but when it comes to further engaging, I'm gonna give a little plug into our campaign here in Perry Sound Muskoka on a personal level. We have over 250 volunteers already in our, for, for my campaign. And I would say of the 250, uh, easily and that just around 200 marks. So whatever, whatever that math works out to 80% about um, are over 65. So, you know, I'm getting feedback every day from our elderly population as they, as they make up a huge piece of our, uh, our core volunteers going door to door making phone calls. And, and that, you know, that part there is just a, a very personal, on a personal level um, where, where we've had some impact. But it's so it's obviously so important that they are part of the conversation. And even though as we hopefully move beyond this pandemic and people are still Zoomed out, but we realize that Zoom should be always part of our, our way going forward because it does um, assist in making life more accessible and providing input uh, with different meetings like this, especially where I am and across Ontario, those in more rural settings. Um, that, that has been a key piece. But it reinforces the need to have reliable internet and that broadband service. Thank you very much, Matt and uh, Matt. I'm just and uh, John. I'm just wondering how you can augment what the true preview speaker said, such that you can uh, listen effectively to our 82,000 members, so that uh, we will have some say in policies that governments do uh, put in place. John. Well, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I'd just like to say it was really uh, great to uh, meet you, Matt and Sarah. It's always a pleasure to be on a panel with you. Uh, Sarah and I, I think, agree on way, way, way more things uh, than we don't agree on. And uh, so um, I just, I'll tell you a little story. We had a, a, um, a, uh, an annual general meeting about three months ago, and uh, we brought a bunch of our nominated candidates there, about 35 of them. And we have a lot of new ones. So I walked into the room and my first thought is, I'm the oldest one here. Uh, it was uh, one of those, uh, I, I call it a, a minor epiphany. Uh, and it made me think about getting, uh, about growing older, uh, because I am older. They're all young, they're all hopeful. We have a great group of candidates. I think you might be seeing uh, one of my colleagues, a candidate for Toronto St. Paul's, Dr. Nathan Stahl, who's um, a geriatrician. And I, I think you'll really enjoy him. But, but besides that, you know, I've, I've spent, I think almost 20, it'd be 23 years um, listening to people in the community. And here in the community of Ottawa South, both is working for the former premier uh, here in Ottawa South in Ottawa, and then uh, in my office. So I, you know, I, I think that um, I have a very active seniors community here, uh, not just in advocacy for seniors, but in advocacy for everything. Uh, a, a lot of people who are now retired, a lot of public servants, a lot of teachers, um, um, healthcare professionals, who continue to advocate. Uh, I've got the, the um, uh, Ottawa uh, uh, Seniors Advocacy Center in my writing uh, here. Uh, I listen to them. I've, you know, I've um, helped, as I said earlier, my, um, uh, my, both my in-laws and my dad, and now my mom through uh, the process of uh, aging uh, and healthcare needs um, as, a, as, a, as a caregiver and, a, and a, uh, an essential caregiver and a decision maker. So I, um, you know, our job is, um, 
a big part of our job as representatives is to be able to listen and to understand, you know, what's important to people. So I think, um, you know, that's always been my stance even before I was elected. You know, my job is, uh, is to um, listen to people and um, uh, to try to give expression to people's um, uh, needs and uh, sometimes desires for change. So, um, you know, I've, um, I think that's a big, I really, I've always taken that as a big part of my job. Um, you really have to listen. Um, um, and that way you can be just, you know, just better be able to solve problems, uh, better be able to help people with their individual problems. But I think, uh, you know, I, I, I benefit from the active group of seniors who advocate about everything uh, in Ottawa South, so. Thank you, John. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the over 300 people from right across Ontario, every part, every corner, north, south, east, and west, who joined us today in crowding into this um, town hall. Uh, I know it's not new for uh, our three guests, but um, it is certainly a joy to have uh, 300 people who are active advocates and voters jump in here and, and hear you. Uh, I, I do thank you, uh, Matt and John, for joining us and, and Dr. Singh for, for being part of this, um, this. It's a critical time. This is a really important election. We're supposedly emerging from the pandemic, supposedly, and we're kind of hoping that we're going to get there, which would be good. And we're trying to build the future here in Ontario. And it needs to be a bit of a kind, more kinder and gentler um, approach, I think, than, uh, than we've witnessed in these last terrible couple of years of, of pandemic. Um, John, you mentioned Nathan Stahl. Nathan Stahl is very much a friend of RTOERO and our foundation. We've been working with him for years. Uh, there is still time to uh, register for our very next uh, town hall, which is uh, on the subject of Jerry. Healthcare. It's next day. It's wow. Uh oh. Um, I don't know. It says says Zoom quit, but it didn't, did it? I hope not. You're good uh, now. Our, <laughs> our our third webinar is on environmental stewardship. That's going to take place on April 27th at 1 p.m. It should prove to be a hot uh, topic as well. So as we mentioned, uh, there's still time to register. We also mentioned that a recording of this particular session will be available, as will the other two town halls, uh, and they'll be up on uh, our website, and we'll make sure that uh, everyone has access to it. And we'll send out email, um, an email with instructions on how to get at that uh, important early um, recording early next week. Thank you, all three of you, for joining us today. You were terrific. And um, thank you, all 300, for coming to the town hall. Take care. Bye, John. Bye, Thank Sarah. Bye. Bye, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Bye.